Welcome to the Good and Basic Podcast, a long-form conversation between Joseph and Joseph, uh, partially about the projects that we do on our YouTube channel, also partially um, about the ideas behind them. Yes. So um, here we are today. You can find our social media information in the... I'm sorry. I'm in the show notes. In the, in the, in the slash, show notes or description or whatever it is below um, below the YouTube video or the podcast episode. Um, so thanks very much for listening. Today we are jumping into, you know, this is another kind of long-awaited podcast uh, for us. We've there, had a couple there's of a these. string of them and there's a few that still need to come. <laughs> One of them is a discussion of independence that's not coming today, that's coming later. Yeah. And whether or not it's a canard or a thing that you can actually do. Yeah. And today we're going to be talking about higher education. Yes. Oh, okay. So higher education. So uh, this is this is kind of a background thing. I was thinking as I was as I was, as I was driving in today, I was like, you know, so we were going to talk about education, right? And I was thinking, you know, like, like where do you start, right? Because there's there's higher education, and at that's the upper left hand brick, and that's a thing. Yeah, at the upper, yeah, uh, uh, you know, yeah, start with this with a with just a small piece of it, right? Um, you know, there's 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 higher education. There's uh, you know secondary and primary education. There's also the education. You know, we could we could talk about. Uh, uh, like trade schools and things like that. And I'm sure that's going to come in today. Uh, there's also sort of more informal modes of education. There's education as such as sort of like an abstract category of human action and development. And so, okay, actually, I like this restriction down to higher education. So that's, that's, that's probably good. <laughs> significantly. So, so college, really. College slash university, whatever you particularly would like to call it. Anything that you're going to do after the state mandated high school level. Yes, Although, you know, it's worth noting that this is probably, you know, even if we don't hit on it, it does inevitably branch out into other areas because, you know, it, you know, one argument that you may, you can make is, well, what secondary education or what post-secondary education does is, well, it builds on secondary education, right? Another argument you could say is, well, you know, it's 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 fundamentally remedial and, what, and all the stuff that we're doing in, in higher education or a lot of it is stuff that we should have been doing, uh, we should have been doing earlier. Um, right. Or, you know, I mean, once you start talking about higher education, you know, another thing we're going to talk about is, is trade schools and uh, the, well, the, the trades, right. Um, and so it probably will inevitably radiate outwards, even if we're starting with higher as education. A, as a general so, structure for the conversation, I suggest that we follow, uh, we briefly talk about some of the videos that have uh, prompted this discussion. Um, there's been at least four that I can think of off the top of my head in the recent past. I did one on whether or not college is already free, mm -hmm. in which I shared some of my doubts about higher education, which I don't think are perfectly well-founded. And the proof of that is the fact that I'm actually going to go work at one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, the second one is a video that I did on the Scholastic Method and I-33 and how to learn sword fightings and Oxford, kind mm -hmm. of all blended together. Yeah. Bit of an eclectic video. And then there were two done at Monticello College, one announcing that I was going to go down there to teach this coming year, and the other one, a long-form conversation, a special podcast episode, actually, with the founder, Shannon Brooks. Mm -hmm. So why don't we kind of vaguely start there yeah, and, then, and then branch out? Sure. Okay. Um, let's start with uh, my doubts about higher education. In, in the basic argument that I made in the video about whether or not college is already free was all of the information that you're going to learn in college is essentially public domain. You can find access to it either in the public domain online or at your local library. Mm -hmm. So why would you spend, <coughs> you know, thousands of dollars a year? Go $60,000 in debt. In order to learn things that you could have gotten for free. Mm -hmm. There's a, a quote, I believe it's from, uh, gosh, what movie is that? It, it's, uh, it's one with Matt Damon and he has this classic line where he says, you. Someday you're going to realize that you spent however many thousands of dollars getting an education you could have gotten for a couple of dollars in library fees. Yeah. Um, and that's the argument I or, made. Or, you know, if you're forgetful, you know, a couple hundred dollars in library fees, but still a lot cheaper. Yeah. And so basically there's this question when you're going to school, going to college, what is it exactly that you are buying? Because there is a transaction involved. You're, mm -hmm. you're spending money. So mm -hmm. what is it that you receive and can you get those same things? Well, cheaper? and I mean, clearly in light of that, what you're buying is the degree. Like, I mean, you know, if, if you accept all those premises, then like to me, the inescapable conclusion is, well, why do we have higher education? Well, so that someone can put a stamp on you and we can certify and authorize that uh, in all caps, you know some things. Yep. You have the paper. Now yeah. you can get a job. Uh -huh. um, I, I, that's the argument I made. And I'm going to actually disagree with it right now because there were some really insightful comments below that video that helped me to realize exactly how cynical I was being. Um, 
some of the things that you get at college include community, including a community of scholars. And I hope you'll mm-hmm. touch on the old root of the word university yeah. at some point in this conversation. But there, there is a major difference between studying things on your own and studying them with a community of peers that are also studying it. There, there's a qualitative difference in how that study goes mm-hmm. and also a qualitative difference between studying stuff on your own and studying under a mentor who actually knows what they're doing. These are both very true facts. If I could add another couple pieces to the puzzle, and I think those are like both pretty darn solid points, right? Um, there's also a large difference typically between undergraduate work and graduate work. Um, where graduate work, well, when you're doing undergraduate work, primarily what you're doing is you're learning the existing systems of knowledge in your field. There and are right do, answers. And when you do graduate work, primarily, well, I shouldn't say primarily what you're doing, but what you're expected to do is to now, uh, you're, you're expected to write publishable material, right? You're expected to extend the boundaries of knowledge. And so, uh, you know, to the degree, right, and I'm oversimplifying here, but to the degree that your undergraduate work basically consists of uh, of assimilating existing information, then it seems to be pretty replaceable by, uh, you know, other sources like a library or, uh, or, or, you know, the good old internet or whatever, right? Um, but the, to the degree that you're talking about graduate type work that is extending the existing boundaries of knowledge, you know, like I, I'm thinking is particularly of the hard sciences, right? Like uh, you cannot do that research in your basement. You need money. Right, you need that you know five billion dollar endowment or whatever it is that your university has, and you need those grants and you need those donors because you can't afford that equipment yourself. You just can't, right? Like, I mean, what makes you think you can go do research in particle physics without a hadron collider? Yeah, exactly, right. Um, so, so that's one thing, and that's less true in some other fields, right? So, for instance, in, in the field that I got a master's in, right, um, in English. Could you stay home and write and read and write your own research papers? Well, yeah, I mean, you, you absolutely could. There's some, there's some caveats there, like if you're doing pedagogy type stuff, then you would need to do in-class research and stuff like that. Um, but, but I guess my, my overall point is that to a larger degree, if you're doing graduate style work, you, it's not just memorization. It's not just reading books. It's not just assimilation of existing information. It's the extension of the boundaries of, of, of I, our collective societal knowledge. I actually really like that because if you set a, a boundary and say maybe there are some things that you can – you, you can replace college with by a, a home study program. Yeah. And then there are some that you can't. The, suddenly we have a division. Now it's a really interesting thing to say, okay, which ones are which? Mm-hmm. Because some of these degrees are apparently overvalued and some of them might even be undervalued. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, and I, well, I think that's probably exactly right. It, it's kind of a meme in our culture now about uh, jobs that require college degrees nominally, but, the, you know, on the official requirements, but that you certainly do not need a college degree to do the job. Um, right. Um, and so, you know, there's a possibility that undergraduate degrees are way overvalued. And, you know, I mean, it sure, sure sounds suspicious, doesn't it? Right? Yeah. Like it, it sounds well, likely. Well, one, one example. So I'm, I'm in law school right now, um, which means I will have been in college for seven and a half years by the time I finish, which uh, shudder a little <laughs> bit to think about that number. Um, one of the funny things about law school is that you need to have a uh, undergraduate degree in order to apply. Mm-hmm. That is a standard requirement. You yeah. need an undergraduate degree in order to just apply. Do they care one tiny little bit what it's in? No. No, <laughs> they don't. And so I have peers who you know studied art history. One of the most common ones is economics, bizarrely enough. Uh, I actually happen to know an interesting statistic on that. Well, I actually don't know the statistic, but I do know that uh, out of all the social science majors, it's the highest uh, econ majors get the highest LSAT scores. Interesting. So, uh, which, you know, probably says some complimentary things about economics in relation to the rest of the sociological fields. (laughs) Complimentary in the direction of economics. (laughs) Sure, sure, sure. I got got to represent the degree. I, I just find that fascinating because it, if, if there is no difference between what degree you have, th- th- there are two arguments you can make. One of them is that any degree will make such a change in you mm-hmm. that any degree will will magically make you f- from a person who shouldn't be applying to law school into a person who should. Or at least any degree properly pursued and earned. Properly pursued and earned. And since they're looking at GPA, maybe that's a metric for how well you were pursuing that. Um, also, I have a bunch of buddies who have engineering degrees who are at the law school. Um, but the other alternative is to say that it is a fluff requirement mm-hmm. that serves one purpose, and that is to limit the raw number of applicants. 
nothing else. Yeah, you, maybe you'd get a bunch of people who have high GRE scores or LSAT scores but haven't gotten an undergraduate degree, and then do you admit them or do you not admit them? Yeah, I mean, I, I can definitely see it that way. Maybe that is what it is. It's just a, a semi-arbitrary limiting mechanism. And arbitrary limiting mechanisms can actually have a purpose. I mean... Semi-arbitrary. Se- semi-arbitrary, because if you have, you, if you require a degree, you know one thing, and that is that somebody is committed enough to pursue a thing mm-hmm. for four years mm-hmm. and, and finish. Well, and also, I mean, there's there's a limit to how lazy and stupid you can be and still get a college degree. I, I have a feeling I'm about to regret that statement at some point. But, but you know, on some level, you know, like, it is true that, that C's de- get degrees, and, like, there's nothing wrong with that in principle, right? But, like, you can... The, you cannot do nothing and still get an undergraduate degree unless it's a diploma mill. Sure, sure. I, I think that's a, I think that is an assumption that is widely accepted, and yeah. I, I think it more or less holds water. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, can I comment about that community thing real fast? Because sure. Because this is actually one of the most fascinating things to me. So a uh, little bit of background. So I got an undergraduate degree in economics from the University of Utah which is the flagship institution of higher education in the state of Utah. I, I think it says that on the website, probably. Um, and then I got a master's degree from... Uh, its Brigham. rival. Yes, from its from <laughs> from its rival, um, Brigham Young University, which is, uh, what is it, like 40 miles south or so, 30 miles south, um, which is a private university owned and operated by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, so here's the really interesting thing is, uh, in the, the University of Utah has... has had some pretty big growth events in the recent past, probably the most significant one being joining the Pac-12 um, recently. Um, and maybe that says something interesting about universities, that your big growth event is joining a football conference. I don't know. I, I, I'll leave that alone, too. Um, but uh, what, what, what was so interesting to me is I realized that my undergraduate tuition at the University of Utah was more expensive than my graduate tuition at BYU. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons for that, but... Um, but it, it's part of a larger pattern where University of Utah tuition rates have been, have been you know, climbing for a while. And, you know, part of the reason is because, at least as far as I can tell, is because, and I'm speaking just hair out of my depth here, um, but I don't think I'm speaking too far out of my depth, that uh, the University of Utah is doing sort of the big university thing. And what that means is that you need to run a big football program and you also need to build a $56 million, I, I think I've got that number right, $56 million student life center that has, you know, a rock climbing wall and this, that, and the other, right? And so there's sort of this, like, big university aura where you, you know, you, you be a big university and you do all the things that big universities do, and that's incredibly expensive. And so you hike the tuition by, like, $1,500 within a couple of years. Even though it's the state school, and, and then you <coughs> move to a private university that's suddenly cheaper. Uh-huh, yeah. So I, what, I'm, what I'm kind of bringing out of that, um, there's multiple lessons we can maybe bring out of that, but one, the thing that I'm bringing out of that particularly is that when I go to the University of Utah, like, was my education one iota better because my tuition was $1,500 more? No. No, what I got was a student life gym. You know, I got a student life center that the university built for $56 million. So basically, I'm paying $1,500 I get, for a gym membership. Yeah, and I get the must. I get the mighty Utah student section. I get to go to football games, and I get to be in a Pac-12 conference, and I get to do all that stuff, right? Like, I, I, yeah, my education, and, and don't get me wrong, like, the University of Utah has a lot of great stuff going for it, right? But uh, my education was not any better because of that tuition hike. <laughs> That is interesting. It makes an it, argument it, for kind of a bare bones style, which, or or at least yeah. it. Well, who is it? Is it is it? There's a there's an important guy who's who's talked about this about the difference between universities, about large research universities and small teaching universities. Does this ring a bell for you? I think it's either Clayton Christensen or Kim B. Clark. I can't remember which one. Both of them are associated with the Harvard Business School, um, and I occasionally get the two mixed up. Um, but they did a lot of interesting research about um, universities and. They contrasted the model of um, of universities like the University of Utah that are large research universities. And in that category also go places like BYU and also places like Harvard and places like Notre Dame and places like a lot of state universities, right? It's like is a large teaching university, large research, or excuse me, large research university, right? And then there's also, you know, smaller schools like um, Brigham Young University, Idaho, that have said, okay, we're not going to do the sports team thing. Um, and we're going to try to use all our resources hyper efficiently to teach students and get them out of the door with degrees. And uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed that I can't remember who it was, whether it was Kimby Clark or Clint Christensen. Um, but they basically said, uh, we think that there is space in the university ecosystem for large research universities in the future. We think that that is a role that needs to be filled. 
but we think that there's too many of them and that a lot of them are going to either have to convert into small, hyper-efficient teaching universities or else die. Interesting. That is really interesting. Um, which, you know, interesting hypothesis that we all get to see play out over the next 20 years, right? Um, yeah. Well, and this, I'd be interested to hear your, your commentary on that since you actually went to Brigham Young University, Idaho. You went to one of these small teaching colleges for your undergrad that's hyper-efficient and tries to get people in and out the door with their degrees. It, it's a very unique institution. BYU-Idaho uh, is also owned by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, so there's, there's three universities, four really, that they own. Um, there's BYU-Hawaii, BYU-Provo, the big one, and then BYU-Idaho, and then they have the, the LDS Business School. Mm-hmm. And uh, the Business College. Business College. Yeah. Um, and, and that's kind of more of a matriculation program. It's like a community college, I as I understand it. I think so. I don't know very much about it, actually. I don't know so. too much either, so I'll not speak too much on that issue. Um, all, all three of them, all four of these institutions have kind of a different uh, role and BYU-Idaho is designed to be a teaching university first and foremost. Mm-hmm. So they do a couple of things very, very differently. They've eliminated tenure as a, as a thing. They've uh, standardized the, the pay of almost all their professors, to, no matter what they're teaching, because it's about the teaching, not the research. Mm-hmm. And then they are very, very, very interested in seeing the difference in, say, test scores and general ability of an individual student from the time they enter to the time they graduate. Mm-hmm. There is... Uh, some data that shows that they, they're they particularly good at this, at showing that you've actually learned and grown while you were at the school, and that's the thing they want to focus on. Um, if you get admitted to Harvard, I understand, as I understand it, um, you've already gotten most of the benefit of the Harvard degree because what they've done is they set the admissions bar so high that if you get in uh, and, you know, hold on by the skin of your teeth, you will you'll graduate, and then you have the Harvard name stamped onto mm-hmm. you. And all of the value that Harvard has now added to the market is just selecting for a particular kind of person. Mm-hmm. They haven't actually spent any time in the teaching or in the change that well, you will undergo while pursuing I mean, the degree. It's, it's also, my, my understanding as I've talked to a variety of people who are involved in higher education is that like an under, I mean, an undergraduate from Harvard or from from a very good university is good, but but people don't don't care so much about that. I had um, a, a cousin I was talking to a while ago who's who's remarkably remarkably intelligent, um, and uh, she was considering pursuing a graduate degree um, back east, and she was talking to these schools. Well, sorry, when she was doing her undergrad, when she was prepping to go to undergrad, she was talking to schools back east. Um, you know, uh, you know, very large, very prestigious universities saying, hey, you know, like, should I? consider applying. And what they said was, no, go to your state school for your undergrad and then come back here for your graduate work because nobody will care where you did your undergraduate work after you've done your graduate work. So there is also a degree to which, you know, like, I mean, what what is an undergraduate degree from an, from an Ivy League or very good university for? Well, it's mostly for farming students of, well, I, I don't know exactly what it's for, but like you don't get that much from it because nobody cares about your undergraduate degree. Which is once, so funny. Once you get a graduate degree. It's so funny to me that that, that is the case. I, mean, I get the general sense, and this is, this is just my sense, mm-hmm. that undergraduate degrees are the new high school diploma. Yes. Okay, so I'm glad you brought this up. This actually is something that I really want to talk about because one of the most remarkable facts about education, about educational systems to me, is the fact that uh, in, uh, back in... So I'm not necessarily signing this just to the colonial times in the United States. But, uh, you know, during the time of the American Revolution, so 1770s, 1780s, 1760s, um, in the United States, uh, like, eight-year-old kids are speaking Latin and Greek. Mm-hmm. John Stuart Mill, he's in England. He's a bit of an anomaly. <laughs> he is a bit of an anomaly. And his dad, frankly, probably broke his brain with how much he educated his son. But John Stuart Mill uh, was was tutoring his younger sister in Greek by the time he was like eight. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So and and this is so John, uh, you know, J.S. Mill is kind of is, is a bit of an anomaly. But like it, it's not uncommon for eight year olds, 10 year olds, 12 year olds to be studying Latin and Greek. And and I don't mean to say you know, the point of this is not let's all study Latin and Greek. My point is we might be underperforming. Like there's a really good chance we're underperforming in terms of our primary and secondary education. And so you end up with, uh, I, I hypothesize, I believe that, as you said, we're ending up with kind of a 
you know, a bachelor's degree is the new high school diploma and a, some kind of graduate degree is a new bachelor's degree. Well, here's some evidence right? and, and for one that. Explanation, one explanation you could propose for that real fast. One explanation you could propose for that is, well, we actually just know so much more. And so you, it takes longer to learn it, right? It, it actually takes longer to get to that higher level, right? We're actually going to a new level. But another thing you could say is, come on, guys, like 200 years ago, people were learning Latin and Greek by the time they were 8 to 10 years old. Like, if there are problems in higher education, how many of them are stemming from gross failures, inadequacies, and incompetencies in primary and secondary education? Gosh. Question. Open well, question. Looking at old models of education, I mean, in a traditional Islamic education, you memorize the Quran by the time you're 10, and you're writing novels by the time you're in your teen years. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I imagine that's a high-end education, but, you know, that's, that's a traditional thing that people were able to do, memorizing large books. Um, it, some evidence for this idea that the new high school diploma is a university degree, I as I understand it, the ACT actually uh, has to adjust their scores every couple of years downward. They, they have to uh, adjust the, the scores that they give up uh, it, as there's essentially um, inflation in terms of what the same score means. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean as much. Yeah. So if, if you got, you know, a 30 something on the ACT, they, they have been adjusting those scores because performance has been going downward. And so they have to adjust what a perfect score looks How like. How interesting. Yeah. And one, one thing How that kind of brought this home to me a little bit, I don't remember. So we went to the same high school yeah. and high school yearbook signings. Yeah. Teenagers writing something in the back of your yes. yearbook. How terrifying. Uh, typically hags. Hags. Have, have a great summer. A great summer. Um, I don't know. If, many I don't know if kids points. still do this. Maybe if we have any high schoolers who listen to us, they could tell us. <laughs> so... But that not, was what we did. That not was, very was high level, right? Yeah, no. And then the handwriting, you look at the handwriting and it's it's a mess. Maybe you can read the hags. Um, and then, I love your face, is a very common one that was... Or was it our time anyway? What was it our time? Who, who knows what they're up to these days? I, I saw some yearbook, uh, end of yearbook pages from the 1940s mm -hmm. um, online. And the penmanship... High school yearbooks. High school yearbooks. Yeah. And the penmanship was excellent and there were Shakespeare quotes. Mm-hmm. We don't do that anymore. No. I don't think we're capable of doing that well, anymore. Well, I don't know. I, I felt like, you know, we went to, uh, well, okay, yeah. I, I won't. No, I think you're largely right. Right. So, so hang on, though. So one thing we're doing here is we are bemoaning the state of education in general and higher education, right? Well, that's and, and exhibit trend. A is, is yearbooks. Sure. No more Shakespeare quotes, no more good penmanship, right? In my day, people learned to write in cursive, right? Um, and so, so there, there's a part of me that then recoils against that or, uh, you know, uh, pushes back against that and says, well, well, hang on a second, right? Like, do, do I really care about the penmanship, right? You know, in the 1940s, they weren't very good typists. Now were they, right? Um, so at least to me, and I don't know what you think about this, but at least to me, it's an open question how much of the new stuff we've acquired has been a good re it, it, it's it, excuse me it's unclear to me how much we've lost as opposed to just shifting replacing. our priorities yes it's a good question so let's let's talk a little bit about priorities what is an education for see and that, I, that's the question is, is an education for getting good penmanship not necessarily you can type just fine see and i like sorry maybe i'm sabotaging things here but I look at that question, I'm like, I don't even know how to start answering that question, right? Because again, like education is so many things. It is so many things. Well, let's start with some it's basics. It's the fact that you can change your oil. It's the fact that you know what a Large Hadron Collider does. It's the fact that you can run actuarial tables in Excel. It's the fact that, uh, you know, you can do, uh, you know, that you can do a green screen effect type thing in Photoshop. Uh, it's the fact that, uh, you know, you know, the, the, the black belt forms of Taekwondo, like it's, it's, it's it's also the fact that you know that you shouldn't lie and that you don't lie. It's also character aspects. You know, it's skills, it's knowledge, it's character, maybe it's more. And so, like, I start with that. And I'm like, gosh, I don't I don't even know. Like, if I start answering that question, then I'm afraid that I have to like that. That's to me, it seems like too big of a question to, to profitably answer. I mean, I can answer in generalities. It's to make a better human being. But it's like, okay, well, like, you know, yes, but that's not very helpful. That's not very, that's not specific enough. And then you need to define what makes better. Which leaves all kinds of room for debate. Uh, does good handwriting make you better? I mean, I, I guess if you had to choose two worlds where you had all the same skills and one of them mm -hmm. had plus Paris. one. Yeah, sure, but it's never it's like that because you have to put the time into it. You do. And right. there's, you know, opportunity cost involved. So I, I'm going to throw out a definition and you uh, you can tear this apart if, okay. if it needs to be torn apart. But 
education is... Oh, I'll tear it apart even if it doesn't. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I thought that was just that what I'm doing here. <laughs> the, uh, the idea of education is growth. So it is, is the ability to grow. And specifically, we're interested in two things, skills and information, which help you to make decisions. So the difference between pre-education self and post-education self is that you know you know things up here in your brain, you know skills or things that you can actually do, and the, the sum of these two things is to help you to be better at making decisions in the real world. Well, I mean, I also want to throw character and education in there. Yep. Because um, I, I actually happen to think that if you know a lot of things, if you know how to build uh, a concentration camp and that if you build a concentration camp and if you put people in the concentration camp and persuade other people to put people in the concentration camp, that actually is not... Something has gone wrong in your education, sir. Something, something very, has gone wrong. very wrong. Yeah. Um, so let's say, I mean, you could say like, it's, it's like a head, heart, hands type thing, right? You need to know things, you need to be able to do things and you need to have, uh, you, you know, some degree of moral judgment, character, or something like that. Yes, and maybe maybe the tools that you use to teach each of these three things are different. Um, teaching moral character is hard to do out of a textbook. Well, I actually wanted to point out one other thing because you mentioned you see education as growth, and uh, this is actually interesting uh, in terms of the etymology of the word educate, which means to draw out. Um, it's it's to uh, you know like to well think about like drawing out a wire, like a metal that can be drawn into a wire is ductile. And I, if I remember rightly, the Latin word is educare, right? So ducare, um, right, like ductile. Right? It's, it's to, to draw it's to, out. Yeah, it's to, and so someone who it's educates to extend. It's is to, drawing out of the student the best parts yeah, of themselves. Drawing out some sort of latent potential. Okay. So it's already Perhaps. in them. They're just well, drawing out the Well, or the, the potential for it is in there. I don't know. I don't want to get too deep into the metaphysical slew. But sure. Right there. Um, but you're, you're drawing that forth into the real world. Yeah. So it was Drawing potential. Now it's now it's real. Now it's actuality. Yeah. Uh, while we're on uh, the roots of words, could could you talk about the word university? Sure, absolutely. So I actually looked it up because I was worried that I would uh, get a couple of get the, like the declension wrong or something. But um, okay, so the word university is derived from the Latin universitas magistrorum et scholarium, which roughly means uh, community of teachers and scholars. Right. So. Uh, universitas magistrorum at scholarium, you can even, you know, just sort of do some guessing there, say, well, it's the university, you know, it's a group of masters and scholars, right? Um, and so to refer to the university yeah, as the so, community. Well, and this is this is interesting to, to backtrack just a little bit to something we've talked about earlier, right? So if you think, so, I mean, this is an open question, what's going to happen to universities, right? Uh, the whole student debt seem, situation seems not so hot. Um, you know, uh, degree inflation seems like not such a great thing. Uh, maybe you don't even want a degree. Maybe the trade schools have something for our society that we are neglecting. Right? Well, you would, I would say yes, they do. Um, uh, so, so the future of higher education is definitely in doubt, right? And so one of the things that you would ask is, okay, well, so what parts of it can survive? What parts of it actually are necessary and helpful and what parts of it are dead weight, right? That student life, gym is that dead weight or not, right? Uh, buildings. How much of this can be done online? How, to what degree are the buildings dead weight? Okay, is your football program dead weight? And if so, to what to what degree? Like, how much is it dead weight? Because the the roots of the word mean that you you have a university the second you have a community mm -hmm. of masters and scholars. Yeah. So that's a hypothesis. Is that maybe maybe the model of a university? Maybe maybe what? And I'm kind of falling into that. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of following that. Uh, research university, teaching university, hypothetical future dichotomy, um, where you have large research universities that are communities of masters and scholars, and they do research together. And then you have teaching universities, which are primarily not that. Where one is interested in pushing the boundaries of knowledge and is yeah. more interested in knowledge for its own sake and, and mm -hmm. you know, kind of the higher level, yeah. and then pushing the frontiers, really. And then yeah. the other is all about kind of bringing people up to speed. Question mark. Yes, that's the hypo. That is a hypothesis, a I, reasonable hypothesis. I think. I want to. I want to jump here to talking about Monticello College. Yeah. So I've, I've accepted a teaching job. I'm really excited about it. Um, and right now, it's very much an academy, and I mean that in the sense of we're, we're studying stuff in the woods. Uh, yeah, the, the peripatetic style. Yeah. So you just wander around and talk to each other. <laughs> basically, yes. The the goal. Uh -huh. 
th there was uh, the word academy refers to a specific wood that was right outside of Athens where Plato did a lot of his teaching. And so to refer to the academy as, you know, the, the every tower and all the buildings of campus mm -hmm. is a little bit of a misnomer because it used to be a community of masters and scholars wandering around talking to each other in the woods. Mm -hmm. And that's kind there's, of what there's Monticello There's a similar is. sort of thing going on with the word symposium. So a symposium is where a bunch of academics get together and read papers to each other, right? But it used to be a drunken party. Yeah, it's literally just, the, well, it's it's this, it's the time after dinner when everybody, it's the time after dinner in ancient Greece, if I remember rightly, where everyone gets roaring drunk and then reads poetry to each other, mm -hmm. right? Which, you know, depending on which symposium you go, you go to may still be an accurate descriptor or not. I, you know, de would depend. <laughs> it depends. Um, <laughs> Probably not at BYU. <laughs> the... Um, the, the funny thing about a symposium, I want to throw this out there. I've been listening to a lecture series on the Great Courses, which uh, is about the other side of history and kind of just talking about what daily life was like in the yeah, ancient yeah. world, which is something that I find super fascinating. Mm -hmm. And uh, one how of these... How did people go to the bathroom? How did they clean themselves? How, how, how did, did they, they wash did they their hands? Yeah. What was it like when they got in a conversation with somebody? Who did yeah. they talk to? Who did they not talk to? What was slavery like? Yeah. I mean, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And in a symposium, there were a number of memory games that people would play. And one of them was you'd throw out a line of memorized poetry. Mm -hmm. And this is from something like the Aeneid or sorry, not the Aeneid. That, that comes way later, like the Iliad or the Odyssey, right? You throw out a line and then the person next to you has to repeat the line immediately before or after that one. Nice. Which means in effect, if you're playing this game with people, you all have the entire Iliad or Odyssey memorized. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is the kind of thing that you can, this is the kind of game you can play in an oral culture. Yes. That's a podcast listening I, culture where you memorize stuff. <laughs> I shudder to think of trying to do that now. There's just too much. I mean, if you have two great books, it's pretty easy to memorize the two great books. If Easier, you have, at least. If you have thousands, it's a little harder. Yeah. But yeah, so that that's another example of education is or there's funny assumptions. There's assumptions. There are assumptions that you have to make about human potential when you're talking about education. Mm -hmm. And I find these ancient examples to be helpful because they say, hey, this is a thing that humans can do. Maybe it's not the thing you should do. I don't think you necessarily should waste your time memorizing the Iliad and the Odyssey. But to, to show what a person is capable of, that you could have that entire book tabulated in your brain so that when someone repeats a line, you can identify the exact line and do the line immediately above or below that it. That is pretty striking. Right then. That's it's really incredible. cool. Yeah. And maybe you don't apply that ability, latent ability in humans there. Maybe you apply it, I don't know, memorizing the tax code or something else more useful. But please don't do that. <laughs> so here's a question I want to ask you about Monticello. Sure. Yeah. So so we, we talked about the question, okay, so what is what is education, right? And in my mind, that's such an important question, but also such a broad question that I'm not even sure how to begin asking it. So here's another interesting question you could answer is what are you hoping to get out of Monticello College? And as background to that question, I would say, I think that this is probably the right question to ask for anyone as they go to a university. Reason being, okay, so let's pretend in a, in a world where universities are just uh, an unqualified good, you don't have to worry as much about what to do there because whatever you're doing there must be good, right? You'll get your college degree. You'll get a better job. You know, that's just better, mm -hmm. right? Now, if, as we hypothesize, and, you know, we're certainly not alone in this, um, that universities are carrying a lot of dead weight. And also that they're expensive. Uh -huh. Then you have to start making some cost-benefit analyses. You need, you need to... Well, what I'm... What, yes. And what I'm suggesting is you need to have a more consciously articulated view of what you hope to get out of it. Yes, I agree. Um, and, and that could be a variety of things, right? Like I'm not, I'm not, you know, some people would say, well, then therefore you can only go into the stem fields. And I'm not saying that. I'm just saying you need to know what you're getting into. You ought to know what you're getting into if you're going to spend $60,000. If you're going to pay the price, right? you need like, to know what you're getting. I mean, yeah. So so here is my question. So I think this is a productive question for anyone to ask as they approach their college education. But uh, let me ask you that question. What are what do you want to get out of teaching out of Monticello? Like, what are you aiming at here? And I guess there's a second question attached to that too, which is what, what does a student need to be aiming for to get the most out of a place like Monticello College? That is a really, really, really good question. Um... Before I begin, we, I did a video clear back at the beginning of this channel called University Resources, mm -hmm. which kind of talks about this, this hunting down your own goals by means of the university rather than letting the university course define you. We'll leave a link to a series of videos related to this topic in the description below. Sure. Um, what am I hoping to get? 
Uh, I I like teaching. I feel like that is something that is one of my my gifts, and I would like to be in a position where I can use it. Mm-hmm. It would seem like a waste to not use something that's pretty close to one of my core gifts, and also not to hone it and make it better. So teaching is a, an important thing to me. I used to teach high school, um, and now I'm getting back into teaching, and I'm excited about that. Uh, a second thing is uh, I'm really, really, really excited about Gosh, there's so many threads here. When you find it working, there's more than one answer. I am excited about the level of freedom that I will have teaching at Monticello. That is one of the major draws for me. Um, I, I've In my contract, I've negotiated to have a fair amount of uh, free time, uh, a couple days a week on which to work on the YouTube channel and other things. And also, as a teacher, there's an off-season, and so I'll have that time. And so that unlocks a lot of freedom to do things that I'm interested in, like running this YouTube channel. And also I have a, an idea or two for a business that I would love to try in real life. Um, one of my passion projects is this idea of independence and how is it that you can make products and, and messages that make independence more possible. And I, I still need to do a lot of exploration in the independence idea to figure out how much of it is, is real. Um, which we should be slugging out, I think, in two weeks. Is yep, the that plan, is the plan. Hypothetical plan. Is that, that is the gonna, plan. We're going to talk all about whether or not independence is a false mirage and interdependence and all that, all that stuff. All that stuff. So that push that down so. down the road a bit. Um, freedom is a big deal for me. Um, I, 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 for me, it's a very subjective thing. Um, one of the reasons why I like the campus is because it's absolutely quiet. When you go there, there's no city noise. There's not really any road noise. It's it's dead quiet. It's peaceful. It's in the woods. And what a place to study the great books and make things. Um, and part of that, I, I think the noise thing and the freedom thing are actually really closely related. Um, I, I do not enjoy the stress of a modern city life or, or some of the philosophical tensions that come with it. And so I'm really looking forward to kind of getting away from it all. That's one of one of my reasons. If I'm being very honest, I mean, mm-hmm. a lot of that doesn't really have a lot to do with the mission of a particular of a university in particular. Um, yeah. Well, I'd, okay. So I was throw it out there. So here's a, here's so what I'm hearing is that is that what what Monticello does for you is it allows you to pursue. Uh, learning with your head and hands in a in a way that is somehow qualitatively different than if you were to teach at a university. Yep. If you were to teach at a different university, you would feel too much like uh, like the institution was was dictating things to you that you don't feel comfortable with. Yes. Yes. And Monticello, you you feel like you have a little bit more elbow room. Mm-hmm. Both intellectually and also and physically, materially. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> The, the, the space is something mm-hmm. that they certainly have down there. Yeah. Water, not so much. Um, yeah. The In terms of the education for students at Monticello College, I mean, the, the value proposition is a little bit strange because it is a uh, unaccredited degree, which means much of the value of the paper, mm-hmm. if, if that is the purpose of a degree, is to get the paper, is massively devalued. You're going to have to do a little bit more work selling the degree. Mm-hmm. And you know, convincing an employer not that or that's impossible. A graduate program, no. Um, assist- but, it's, but it's a lot harder than just you know accredited by what is it, the Northwest something something or other Association of Accreditation. Right? Yep, it's and there's no no plan to ever become accredited. That's not a a, a, we... a series of hoops <laughs> they want to jump through. They, the the funny thing about this is that there's a sister institution of this one that was called George Wythe College, which uh, managed to get their graduates into high end law schools, kind of routinely. And so it's not a totally devalued piece of paper, but Mm -hmm. we'll say it's a a relatively devalued piece of paper. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to go to that college, you have to be willing to take a hit in the paper department. And you presumably then that needs to be made up for somewhere else in terms of are you actually learning and growing enough? Is there enough difference between the, the you that got admitted to the, to the program and the you that left? What, what differences do you think somebody would 
aim for and get by going to Monticello College? I think there's two halves. One of them is the liberal arts half, which is going to train you to think, to think precisely and clearly and uh, to be to be able to flirt with heresy, mm-hmm. to, to be able to think constructively on your own, to be able to argue for a position, to be able to stick to an unpopular position, to the ability to change your mind from an unpopular position. I mean, you need to be able to think as an independent person. Mm-hmm. And you need to have some tools and, and some material to work with because, frankly, almost everything that's ever been thought, uh, or everything that could be thought has already been thought somewhere. And so you can't just do that in a vacuum. You need to read great thinkers. You need to argue the ideas with, with your peers and with others. And you need to get in the habit. The second thing is learning how to work. And that you do through farm, chore, mm-hmm. farm chores and getting up before dawn. For example, the permaculture conference you attended. Yes. Right. Yeah. Well, and so this is another interesting thing, right, is, uh, you know, going back to the question we started with, okay, so why get an undergraduate degree if all the information is available on the internet, right? So, and, and this is actually a thing I've been wondering. Uh, sorry, I, I'm getting to the real question. Uh, so let's just tackle the liberal arts portion of things, right, which roughly speaking, consists of read books, discuss them, write about them. Mm-hmm. So, um, Which sounds super simple. Well, yeah, I, I, I believe in it 100%. Like, I don't, I don't know if there's a better model for learning that kind of thing, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so here's an interesting thing that I have wondered for a while now. The Internet is full of podcasts. The Internet is full of forums. I mean, a couple months ago, I was introduced to Discord, right, um, which has some very powerful, like, interpersonal uh, capabilities, right? And so, I mean, we're drowning in online communication platforms, or I should say in digital communication platforms, right? So what if you just did the liberal arts portion on Reddit? Podcasts? Or, yeah. I, so here's, here's the big issue, is you need to be able to discuss back and forth. Mm-hmm. Right, and so podcasts are not super amenable to that, where something like Reddit or Discord is. You also right? need to be able to do it in real time without taking a break or hiding or ghosting somebody. Real-ish time. Yeah. Right. I mean, so I've taken online courses. You've probably taken online courses, like online university courses too. Yep. And, you know, at, at least in most of the ones that I've taken, there's some sort of component where you have to do weekly posts. You post something, other people post something in response to what you're saying, and you post mm-hmm. something in response, right? So here's my question is, like, why don't we just do that on Reddit, and then we could all get a liberal arts education and not pay out the nose for it. Like, why hasn't that happened? I, first of all, I think you could. Um, I think there are some things that you lose uh, in terms of, you know, you know the statistic that most of your communication is nonverbal, which means if you're going to learn to discuss in person, you're going to learn to discuss with more of yourself than if you're just writing, mm-hmm. where it's just the words standing on their own. Um, you get to deal with things like inflection and how do you handle a conversation that makes you angry in real time? How do you control your face when you're in that conversation? And or how do you, how do you respond that, to that in real time? Mm-hmm. As opposed to on a posting board, you know, you can go to the refrigerator, get a snack, sit down, cool off for a minute, and then type a response. Which, you know, people should probably do more. Yes, they certainly should. <laughs> but th- there, there are skills that are developed in the one that would not be developed in the other. Although Many those, of don't, the skills those don't seem be. to me to be absolutely lethal objections, though. No, I don't think they are. Um, I think that one of the values of a liberal arts education today, uh, because we are drowning in media, is the ability to de- 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 personally determine what is worth your time and what's not. And for that, you need to do a couple of things. You need to get good at triage. You need to get very disciplined in terms of what you will and will not read, which means probably reading really hard books would be a handy thing. Because if you can muster the will to do that and get in the habit, that is the same kind of will that's going to allow you to choose consciously what it is that you're going to consume media-wise. And also, if you are... uh, good at thinking, if you are good at thinking, then your ability to identify bad arguments and subpar media goes up as well. I think the number one thing in, uh, let's say, uh, Benjamin Franklin's education, his whole education was, if I can get a book, I will read the book. That's the whole line of code. The line of code for his education is, if I can get access to the book, I will devour the book 
and and Which, uh, have the book. Which worked pretty well for him. It worked really well. I, that is that is a strategy that would be absolutely <clears throat> awful to try today. I mean, you could just find. Uh, I can't remember how, Fantasy many, how many videos of it, how many videos, or excuse me, how many gigabytes worth of videos are uploaded to YouTube every second. Some outrageous number. Yeah. Like and if, because if you, if you put it on like 10 times speed, you, you still couldn't keep up. No, not even close. Not even close. If you were to follow that strategy today, it would be a total waste of your time. I, I think that most books are garbage and most movies are garbage and most music is garbage. And Pareto, the, Pareto principle strikes again. 80% or something like that. I think the the, the thing that, that you are cultivating, I mean, you're doing this constantly. You're filtering through the giant list of recommended videos. And, you know, as good as the YouTube algorithm is, a lot of the stuff it recommends to you are like, I don't want to see that. Mm-hmm. And even if I do want to see or that, maybe I shouldn't be watching that. And then it sends you 100 cooking videos. Yeah. I may or may not have had that problem. Dive down that rabbit hole. <laughs> So the ability well, to, want to, watch the other to master your your media consumption is one of mm-hmm. the advantages. And for that, well, I think an environment like Monticello College where, you know, there there is less technology access and less power and more hard books. That, that could be a four-year program in uh, the discipline to own your own media consumption and <coughs> to think critically through what you will and will not consume. You know, uh, speaking of why you would go to a university, uh, there was a thought that occurred to me a couple years ago. So when I did my undergrad, um, I was I was fortunate enough to be scholarshiped and I was also living at home at the time, so my expenses were extremely low, right? So fundamentally, I was going to college for free, right? Which I've paid for college and I've not paid for college and I can tell you which one I prefer. Um, so here's, here's an interesting thing that I realized a couple years ago is that if when I went to the University of Utah, I kind of waffled around for a while because I didn't really know what I wanted to study. And I believe I eventually declared in economics because they wouldn't let me register for classes unless I declared in something in economics. It sounded pretty good. Um, it was a little bit more complex than that, but that's that's the basic rundown, right? Um, so it, it occurred to me that, you know, if I had been going into large amounts of student debt to do that, that probably would have been a very stupid decision. Yeah. Right. Uh, spend Spend four years, spend two years not knowing what you're doing while the debt just and keeps then, filing. And then sign up for something that you're not 100% committed to, perhaps, mm-hmm. right? Uh, that's a very expensive little experiment, you know? Um, so I've, I've often thought, you know, if I was not scholarships, probably a smarter thing for me to do would have been to try to learn from other sources and to go get a job. At least uh, until you knew exactly what you wanted to do. And once... Or, once well, and I don't... Yeah. I mean... I want to be careful here because there's merit to exploration, right? And it has not worked out too badly for me. It has not worked out too badly for me, right? And well, and part of that is because of scholarship. And so I did not end up $60,000 in debt, right? Um, but I, I think that that's... I think that that's a question that it would profit a lot of people to answer is to be a little bit more specific about what they want to get out of university and to resist the peer pressure a little. I'm not saying don't go to university. I'm saying make a decision about it. I'm saying make a decision about it that's your decision, uh, that, that you feel comfortable with and that you've thought through things and you've decided what you like and what you don't like and what you're going to aim for. And I, I think that that would be a really solid piece of advice. And there's no shame in taking a break from college while well, you're figuring that out. There rather will be, than but it would be worth the shame because the shame is stupid. <laughs> so one, one thing that is interesting to me about the debt is debt constrains your choices uh, from the moment that you get debt. Yeah. Um, w- one uh, one example I'm going to throw out is law school. Law school is typically very expensive. The reason I went to BYU, among others, uh, one so, of the major reasons was that it's it's outrageously cheap compared to other law schools. I mean, if you're if you're comparing ranking with price, there there is nothing that comes close. And so I, I'm going to graduate with some student debt, but way less than I would otherwise. And because I have less debt, I can accept lower paid positions. Mm-hmm. And, you know, where, where Monticello College is a startup, this, uh... this allows me to, to do something that I'm really going to enjoy and to, to take that level of freedom because I'm not obligated by my debt to take a high paid position and to go work for, at the, you know, Cravath scale at some large firm. Uh-huh. Because I, you I don't have to. Because you have to. Because you have to. Yeah. If you, if you, you have a large amounts of debt. in a hard place if, you, if you're in that situation, right? And Which, you, if, you, if you, that's what you want to do with your life, then, then you, know, you don't feel bad about the constraint. Sure. 
But maybe maybe you thought you wanted to when you started getting the debt, and by the time you finish getting the debt, you don't want to anymore. <laughs> and now you have to because you have the debt. Yeah. So that's a thing to worry uh, about as well. It makes me think of uh, something that John Boyd once said. Uh, I'm going to, I guess I'll link to the video about John Boyd in the comments below. But John Boyd is a fascinating individual. Um, anyway, so when he was working at the Pentagon, um, one of his friends asked him, you know, why are you doing all this? Why are you waging this like internal guerrilla war against against uh, corruption and bureaucracy in the Pentagon? And what he said was, there are only two ways in this world to be free, to do whatever you want. And one of them is to have all the money and power in the world so that nobody can stop you. And the other is to drive your needs down to zero so that nobody has any leverage against you and nobody can threaten you or stop you. Two ways to freedom or to have scads of money or to be in poverty. And what John Boyd said was, I will never have enough money to do whatever I want. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to drive my needs down to zero so that I have complete freedom to act. And that's fundamentally what he did. Uh, You know, so so he could have he he could have gotten some very, 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 very uh, lucrative jobs in the defense industry. And what he ended up doing was living in a small um, apartment and waging an internal guerrilla war against corruption and bureaucracy in the Pentagon. Um, and living as an ascetic, basically. Yeah, yeah, they actually called him the Ghetto Colonel. Was one of his nicknames. Was one of his nicknames. Um, so that that relates to that because you know maybe the solution to some of our problems is you drive down your needs, and if you drive down your needs, then it gives you a little bit more freedom, and maybe in some situations that's a little bit better than increasing your increasing what. Better than increasing your abilities is decreasing your needs sometimes. I agree. I agree. Something something like that. Better, better for developing freedom mm-hmm. and personal accountability. Yeah. and it, it would depend a little bit. Yeah. But it's certainly a thing worth considering. Right. It's a thing worth considering. Again, I, I think this comes back to your point about know what your goals are. If, if college, if, if you are going into an eyes wide open mm-hmm. and you know what you're paying for, you know what you're paying, you know what you're paying for, and you want it, and it's worth it. Do it. And if you don't n- know, <clears throat> and if you're not making that decision consciously, that's a major problem. And if you consciously know that it's not a good decision, then stop it. Mm-hmm. In spite of potential social judgment. <laughs> In spite of potential social judgment. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think we're about done. Are we about I think so. There's one other thing I want to throw in here, actually, real fast, which is, um, so... If I'm curious, if you are curious about uh, sort of doing a liberal arts education on Reddit or Discord, I want to hear your thoughts about that particularly. I mean, we would love to hear your thoughts about all of the podcasts in the comments below, but I would be particularly interested to hear your thoughts about that. It's something that I'm interested in um, in exploring, and so I'd be curious uh, what you think about that, if that's something you'd be interested in, or what do you think the pros or cons of it would be. So uh, Maybe we could even get that sort of thing started. Yeah. Anything else we want to talk about? No, I think we should wrap it up. Okay. Well, thank Thank you you so much much for watching. And we will see you next time.